We have a land here that works alone. Yeah. And you just have to take out stones and every farm is this small and corners here and corners there. Terrible little fields, and yeah. We come here and we just look at we can plow as far as our eyes goes and you have to work a lot more down there. Between Mercedes and General Vichekas, there's nothing but flat, fertile land producing maize, wheat and soya bean. With a temperate climate and good rainfall, it's some of the most fertile land in the world. These yokes are a fairly familiar sight along the side of roads in Argentina. It's basically a fleet of combines waiting to be hired. And one of these machines could easily cover about 10,000 acres during the course of its year or its harvest when it moves from the north of the country right down into the south following the crops as they come into maturity. I suppose it's because they're covering such a huge area that they can do it for next to nothing. It literally costs about six euros an acre to hire one of these things compared to maybe 40 or 50 euros an acre at home. It's no contest really, is it? Life on the road, though, is tough for these contractors. Well, they wait here for one, two, three days, and if they don't get hired, move so, on. Yeah, move on yeah, to next town. This started at north in Tucumán in Santiago del Estero, and then, well, they they don't see the families for maybe two months. Yeah. So. Tough life. Yeah, tough life yeah. So will these men ever own their own machinery and be able to hire that out then to farmers mm -hmm. and clients? Impossible. No, 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 no. We are saying that it's impossible. Impossible. A machine of those could cost you some three hundred thousand dollars. And they told me that in a campaign they can make money just to buy a wheel of those machines. Really? Argentina is 40 times the size of Ireland and with millions of acres of potential farmland still covered by scrub, Argentina can only become a bigger player on global markets, be it in wine and lemons from the Andes and tropics or beef and grain from the Pampas. Land in Argentina is incredibly productive, so much so they can actually get two crops a year out of every field. For example, in this field, three days ago there was a crop of wheat. Today, they're already re-sowing it direct into the stubble. No ploughing, no tilling, no waiting. And in five months' time, they'll be harvesting the next crop, a crop of soya bean, right here. Well, you're seeing a lot of investment in productive land in Argentina coming from large international investment sources, such as groups related to the financier George Soros have bought local press reports say that they control up to 200,000 hectares of farmland. And though the farm, farm values have surged over the last years and doubled in some cases, relatively speaking, compared to what farmland would be costing in Europe, it's extremely cheap. So the combination of the relatively cheap land and cheap labor costs, production costs, has um, caught people's attention, combined with the strong demand that they're going to see for, for farm products, both for food and for biofuels in the future. The Irish that are coming here the last years, they're interested in buildings and, and in uh, uh, agriculture. We haven't reached our borders in agriculture or in cattle breeding, the United States has no more room for uh, expanding the corn belt or the soya and Canada can't grow more wheat and uh, the Europe of course has no more place to sow anything. We keep on growing and we're using the last technology in genetics, in machinery and in seeds. But it's that use of genetically modified crops that's both the driver of Argentina's agricultural success and the biggest bone of contention with farmers in the EU. With the aid of genetic modification, soy has become the most profitable crop, with a massive extra 1.2 million acres added to the total area grown in 2006 alone. 
There is concern from environmentalists about the, the massive expansion in soy cultivation. One, because with this monocultivation or monocrop development, the country becomes exposed to, to fluctuations in world soy price prices, let's say, or to diseases, to potential diseases that can take advantage of the lack of, of genetic uh, diversity within the crops. And the, the high profitability and the ease of raising soy makes it sometimes less likely for farmers to rotate the crops in a way that's sustainable and manageable, which they have done traditionally. This area in Vijegas, where this farm is, 10 years ago, grew nothing but lucerne for fattening cattle that came from up in the bad lands of northern Argentina. This, the circle cows are up there, and the poor lands of northern Argentina. And they came down here to graze lucerne and finish, right? 1996, genetically modified soybean appeared and they started burning out the lucerne and planting high-value soybean. I mean, if you take the Argentinian government's attitude to genetically modified crops, genetically modified crops are good for farming. They're good for Argentina. We're having them. End of story. There's no debate. There's no answers. But well, that's great, Jim, if, you're, if, if you don't care about the environment. But, I mean, Europe cares about the environment. It, it, uh, but it's in I, the case that the Argent we, 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 we are farming far more environmentally friendly here than in Europe, because there's no ploughing, there's no cultivation, so there's no nitrate loss. The nitrate loss is zilch. We're using much lower rates of um, fungicide and herbicide. You take these soybeans, right? They're spotlessly clean. All that will get, those, that soybean will get, is two small doses of Roundup, which everyone uses in their garden. And that's the chemical input for the year. Jim's enthusiasm for farming here is infectious, and when you see the first of the farms the fund has purchased, it's easy to understand his excitement for the project too. This is one of the farms we've bought, um, 9,000 acres. 9,000? Uh, yes, it's... Um, all in the one block? In the one block, it's uh, 14 square miles, it's almost six miles long and about two and a quarter miles wide. And we're pretty much standing in the middle of it here, like kind of a crossroads. So Definitely. as far as I can see that way, and as far as I can see this way, yeah. and that way, every direction is just the one farm. The one farm. It's hard to imagine, isn't it, from where we come from, you know? And the average size of the fields? It must be a Most of, of the fields in Argentina are 100 hectares. They're a kilometre by a kilometre. So that's 247 acres. The good farming companies here are farming at a standard that would put us to shame because they have never had subsidies, so they're totally commercially driven. In fact, the government is taking 20% off the top of their crops. You know, when you sell your crop here for export, 20% is taken off the top by the government. So instead of being getting a subsidy of 20%, they're getting 20% off the top, and the tax rate is then 35% on the profits. So they're fantastic farmers. They really are fantastic farmers here. It's like everywhere else, that the yields vary with the quality of the land. You know, we could go to Santa Fe province, and get six ton maize yields, but we have to pay $15,000 a hectare for the land. So for us, the return is no good. This is about return on capital, Dara. It's not about smart crops or whatever. It's, it's not about, about getting it. record yields. It, it has nothing to do with yield. You know, it's, it's uh, as the Americans say, it's all about profit and the rest is just commentary, you know? After two years of analysis, these investors have gone in the deep end, splashing out a massive 55 million euros on over 40,000 acres. And they ain't finished yet. You're looking at a three-way equation. There's ability to get title, the price and the quality. And here we think we're by far and away the best of the three. Elsewhere in the world, if you go to Ukraine, fabulous quality land, title is a big issue. It all sounds brilliant. Great weather. Great soils, big fields, an economy that's on the up. There's got to be a downside. Of course there's a downside. There's a downside to everything, you know. Um, and you can look for all kinds of downsides. You can have wet years, you can have dry years. This is farming. We mightn't get the lift in commodity price that we think we're going to get. That's a potential downside. But, you know, there are always risk factors, but we have covered a lot of the risks. Our legal structures, our company structures could be a risk, but we've covered all those. We've hired the best people to set them up for us. So, you know, we've tried to eliminate the risks as we've gone along. I know this whole venture was about finding a profitable investment, but had you any sense of when you arrived out here that you were following in the footsteps of a lot of Irish who'd gone maybe 100 years or 150 years before you? Irish people like good land and there's, there's like returns from land and they tend to follow good land. So, and the thing is, just we're doing nothing new here. The only difference is we can go home more regularly yeah. uh, rather than the earlier, earlier people. But it's not, it's nothing new. And 
why, you know, there's a lot of people at home have a bit of a sense of wonder about this and have voiced the opinion that we might be idiots coming here at home. But Irish people have done this for hundreds of years and so what's different now? And if Jim's enthusiasm has sparked an interest in a career in farming, tune in next week when we assess the agricultural options for students as the CAO deadline approaches. Does forestry damage the environment? And a unique mobile milking parlour in the West.